UNEMPLOYMENT, A MOVE, AND AN UNSOLVED ARSON. TONIGHT WE'RE TAKING A CLOSER LOOK AT WHAT WAS HAPPENING IN THE LIFE OF DANNY HEINRICH IN THE MONTHS AND DAYS BEFORE AND AFTER JACOB WETTERLING WENT MISSING. HEINRICH IS IN JAIL, CHARGED WITH POSSESSING CHILD PORNOGRAPHY. He's been named as a person of interest in Wetterling's kidnapping, but has always denied having anything to do with the crime. Tonight, WCCO's Liz Collin investigates a timeline that includes an attempted abduction in St. Joseph that was left out of the spotlight. Every year of Danny Heinrich's life is being scrutinized. Documents suggest one in particular was filled with turmoil. That year was 1989. A then 26-year-old Heinrich was having financial trouble. In March, his Mercury Topaz was repossessed. Investigators believe he used that car to sexually assault Jared Shirel in Cold Spring. Heinrich admitted to his attorney in a burglary case years prior he'd been having problems dealing with his parents' divorce. His mother remarried in July of 1989. And Heinrich stopped working at Finger Hut in St. Cloud on October 8th of that year, although it's unclear why. There can be trigger events, be they positive or negative, which can kind of direct their behavior. Former Brooklyn Park Police Chief Don Davis was not involved with the investigation into Jacob Wetterling's kidnapping, but in his 35 years in law enforcement, he knows a lot can be learned from the time leading up to a crime. So I equate it to shoplifting. The first time an individual shoplifts, they may take one item and it was really traumatizing, but the more they think about it, hey, it was rather easy, I'm gonna do that again. Same thing with these, these child offenders. Newspaper clippings, magazine articles. Robert Dudley knows that time period well. He published a book about Jacob's abduction, sorting through 25 years of promising leads and dead ends. The more questions he answered, the more questions there were. Dudley felt like he never had many answers. Danny James Heinrich was arrested pursuant to federal charges. Until the news last month. And there was just a slew of reported attempted abductions. In his research, Dudley discovered in July of 89, three months before Jacob was kidnapped, a nine-year-old St. Joseph boy told police he ran from a man driving a light tan van who asked him to get inside. <laughs> Authorities released this sketch of that man a week after Jacob went missing. If it is Heinrich, it's the only sketch of him with glasses, which he is usually pictured wearing. Some parents immediately called to say their kids saw that same man driving around St. Joseph that summer, snapping pictures. While we don't know if Heinrich had access to a van, WCCO found more recent records show Heinrich registered eight cars in the past 11 years. Perhaps one of the most telling pieces of all is the FBI profile they released of the suspect just three days after Jacob's kidnapping. A white male, 25 to 35 years old, employed in a low-skilled job. They believed he'd recently been through some sort of high-stress event in life that led to the high-risk way he kidnapped Jacob. They also thought the threat of a gun indicated he tried something like this before and failed. To me, it's more than coincidence. Davis says equally as important as what happened before is what happened immediately after. Sources told WCCO just this year, investigators revisited Heinrich's connection to an early morning arson on November 12th of 89 at a home he was known to visit. It's the same date documents say Heinrich started a new job. Two weeks later, Heinrich moved from his downtown Painesville apartment where he'd lived for years, two miles away, into his father's basement. Potential victims of Danny Heinrich have been told by investigators that Heinrich lost 60 pounds before Jacob Wetterling's kidnapping and then put 60 pounds back on in the few months that followed. It's another indication experts say that he may have been trying to avoid detection. Amelia. All right. Thank you, Liz. The Wetterlings will host a community meeting Monday night in Painesville. They're calling it a night of healing and sharing. Investigators are expected to talk about what kind of tips they're still looking for in this case to help narrow the focus. It begins 7 o'clock at Painesville Heights School.